this is maybe the highlight of my year right now that I get to introduce to you Dar, my friend, my teacher, my hero. During the war, the ongoing war, when we despaired that we were getting no information about what was going on in Iraq, this young man stood up off a mountainside and said, I have to let the world know. And he courageously and heroically went to Iraq and over time spent nine months in Iraq and has told us all about what was going on in words that were understandable, comprehensible, and honest. So he's the answer to my prayer in journalism. And now he's working with soldiers. He's worked a lot with the vets. They trust him. They trust him because he has earned their trust, because they know they can trust his honesty, his integrity, his courage. I ask you to join me tonight in being grateful to welcome Dar, and we'll listen to him, and then we're going to ask you to help us raise the money, and then will you do some Q&A? And then after our paddle bid, then we'll have some questions and answers. Listen carefully. He has so much to teach us. Well, first of all, thanks everyone very much for uh, having me here tonight. It's a real honor to be uh, in the room with such a great group of folks. And especially thanks Jerry and, and Bob Haynes for continuing to support me and love me and take care of me uh, in all the ways that you do. Um, I wrote a book recently called The Will to Resist. It's about soldiers who are refusing to fight in Iraq and Afghanistan. And given uh, that this is a PSR event, I was asked by Jerry to talk specifically about uh, the, the situation of soldiers, their wounds, psychological, uh, physical, and otherwise. So I'm going to get right to it by talking about one of the first men in the military that I met that his story was an inspiration for me to actually start doing investigations and, and actually write this book. His name is Eli Wright. And he had gone to Iraq as a medic with the desire to help people. Upon arrival in the city of Ramadi, he, along with another medic, was called to an, quote, enemy detainment camp because a prisoner there needed medical assistance. At the entrance of the detainment facility, Wright was pulled aside by his battalion surgeon and instructed, quote, anything that you see in there, inside those walls, stays in there. You don't talk about any of it after you leave that place. The cell he was taken to was a dark and damp enclosure of bare concrete cinder block walls with a concrete floor and no lights. His memory reconstructs the scene for me and his experience is important enough to be quoted at length. It was the scent of blood that hit me immediately on walking in there. It was, sort of old, it was a sort of old stale scent of blood that had just permeated that place for a long time. And they walked us inside and there was this prisoner in there completely naked except for a small little cloth tied around his waist. And he was standing up on top of a cinder block that was placed on end. They said that he had been there for three days. His scabbed hands, tied with zip ties that cut into his wrists, were purple and swollen. This guy had the most confused, glazed look on his face. He was being interrogated by several men who were just grilling him. They said he had been up for three days in this interrogation process. He had not slept. They had this bucket of water, which they would splash on him whenever he dozed off. They took him off the cinder block and stood him against the wall and told us to start checking him out. And I didn't even know where to begin. He was covered in bruises. His face was all busted up and bleeding. This other medic started to check him out. Our task was more or less to see if the guy was stable, to ascertain if he was in any condition to continue his, his interrogation. He had some cuts on his face, on his nose and his eyebrow, and we started taping those up, not really doing much, just kind of dabbing away blood clots and applying tape over it, not even cleaning the wounds or anything. He was complaining of pain on, his side of his, on the side of his chest, on his back. 
He had a lot of bruising on his ribs, so the medic started feeling his ribs, and he pressed on a couple of his ribs, and the guy just screamed in pain and sort of buckled. They picked him up and slammed him against the wall. The other medic told me to feel his ribs so I could see what it, was, see what it felt like, and said he's got a couple of broken ribs. I verified that his ribs were broken, and the medic started feeling around the rest of the area around his ribs to feel if there were any more fractures. And then suddenly he cocked his fist back and punched him right in the broken ribs. And the guy just dropped and screamed. I was stunned. It shocked the hell out of me. It was an important moment for me, seeing a medic, a fellow care provider, violate our code of ethics, which is first and foremost to do no harm, and to see, of my own, and to see one of my own doing that to a, I guess he was just a prisoner of them, but to me, I didn't see him that way. He was a confused, broken human being. And to see a medic do that to him, I don't know. I, I think it just kind of destroyed my perception of us doing anything good there for these people. That's when I realized that we weren't there to help anybody. Nothing we could do would be to their good. After that point, I don't feel like there was any further good I, I could do for those people. This was my first night there. I never talked to anybody else about it. I was going to testify about it in Winter Soldier, but was not able to. This is actually the first time that I've spoken about it. That is Eli Wright, and that is just the very, very tip of an iceberg that is really what we're in the process now, which is the total collapse of the US military because of two ongoing, endless occupations, one in Iraq with over 131,000 US soldiers, all the general, the generals there believe there will be well over 100,000 troops until at least halfway through next year. And according to uh, senior officials in the Obama administration, we're looking at a minimum of between 50 and 75,000 US combat personnel in Iraq until at least the end of his first term, which is 2013. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, we have the tail end of the first Obama surge, 21,000 more troops in, into Afghanistan. And uh, that's just about at an end. So that brings the total number to 69,000 US military personnel in Afghanistan. And then, of course, we have the news from yesterday that McChrystal, uh, the senior US military commander in charge of all NATO and US forces in Afghanistan, is, uh, has filed a report and is asking for up to 45,000 more American troops in Afghanistan. Change you can believe in. Surpassed only by our average Iraqis, members of the US military who've been deployed to Iraq are paying the highest price for the occupation, both while in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as when they come back home. They are now part of an unfortunate, tragic segment of US society that has been maligned and tossed aside, neglected, forgotten. Today, more US war veterans are killing themselves than are dying in open combat while overseas. 1,000 veterans who are receiving care from the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA, are attempting suicide every single month, and 18 veterans kill themselves daily. The most conservative estimates show us that one out of every four homeless people on the streets of this country are veterans of some war. As if sur surviving their deployment to Iraq or Afghanistan is not enough, upon their return home, soldiers face another battle to obtain the service they are entitled to receive from the VA. A valid discharge from the military entitles all soldiers to medical care from the agency. In the six months leading up to March 31, 2008, 1,467 veterans died while waiting to learn whether their disability claims were going to be approved by the government. Veterans who appeal a VA decision to deny a disability claim must wait an average of nearly four and a half years for their answer. As of March 25, 2008, 287,790 war veterans from the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan had filed disability claims with the VA. If we include all veterans of all wars, the number just went over, over a million claims that had been filed and, and yet uh, to have any response to. The deeper one digs, the more apparent it becomes that the military is in a state of near collapse. We've had all the generals getting up and talking about this regarding Iraq, now we're starting to see it regarding Afghanistan. And that's because, speaking of both occupations, 
at this point, well over 565,000 troops have been deployed more than one time. By December of 06, it was estimated that 50% of the troops in Iraq were serving on their second tour, and another 25% were on their third or fourth tours. We can rest assured that these numbers are far, far higher today. The military is so overstretched that troops are being redeployed that often have traumatic brain injury, TBI, from surviving roadside bombs in previous deployments, and more than 43,000 troops listed as medically unfit have been deployed anyway. Soldiers already diagnosed with PTSD and other severely debilitating mental health conditions that accompany it are being redeployed as the military dredges up troops to keep enough boots on the ground in both occupations. By October of 07, the Army reported that approximately 12% of combat troops in Iraq and 17% of combat troops in Afghanistan were coping by taking antidepressants and sleeping pills. More active duty Marines committed suicide in 2008 than in any year since the U.S. invasion of Iraq was launched in 2003. Simultaneously, 2007 was a record number of suicides in the U.S. Army, only to be surpassed by another record in 2008. And this year, we are well on track to set another record of suicides in the Army. In addition, about 30% of all troops in Iraq and Afghanistan are National Guard members. So much for the one weekend a month. Doesn't exactly help morale. And so what the military is doing to try to cope up, to, to keep up with keeping enough boots on the ground, and it's going to be an entirely different story when uh, these next 45,000 troops or so uh, will start their deployments to Afghanistan, is the military is doing things like, for example, on June 22, 2006, they increased their permissible uh, enlistment age up to 42 from a previous limit of 40. This followed a previous rise in the age limit from 35 to 40 in March 2005. By summer of 2007, the Army had grown so desperate for recruits that it began to recruit indiscriminately in violation of its own criteria. It accepted individuals with health and weight issues, lower academic test scores, and even those with criminal records. By July 2007, the number of incoming soldiers with prior felonies or convictions had more than tripled over the previous five years. And in the first half of 2007, the Army had accepted an estimated 8,000 recruits with rap sheets. Former Army Private Steve Green is one such example. You might remember him. He was awarded a waiver for previous involvement in criminal activity and then was allowed, of course, to join the military, and then was later found guilty of raping a 14-year-old Iraqi girl, Abir Qasim Hamza al Janabi, and murdering her and her three family members in the village of Mahmoudia. I want to share another story of another soldier to give you sort of a case study of, of what is happening to, to individual members in the U.S. military because untreated PTSD and the accompanying nightmares and insomnia, heavy substance abuse, and several failed attempts at self-medication are taking their toll. After witnessing atrocities in the Sadr City region of Baghdad, Christopher Goldsmith had returned home shattered, only to learn he was being stop-lost and redeployed to Iraq. Testifying on the panel breakdown of the military at a Winter Soldier event in Silver Spring, Maryland, Goldsmith gave this account of his response to the news of his being stop lost. The moment I learned that, I swung from being the happiest I had ever been in my life to the most depressed. My joy had come from the sense of relief I felt at the thought of being released from the prison called the Army. When the, that prospect receded, I experienced the most depressing, most agonizing downward spiral I could imagine anyone going through. I was to be redeployed the same week as I had hoped to be discharged as per my contract, and that was in May of 2007. The day before I was supposed to deploy, Memorial Day, I went out onto a field at Fort Stewart where there's a, a, a memoriam, a tree planted for every, every soldier in the 3rd Infantry Division that has died. I went out among those fallen soldiers and tried to take my own life. I went out, I took pills, and I went back to my regular poison of vodka and drank until I couldn't drink anymore. The next thing I knew, I was handcuffed to a gurney in the hospital. The cops had found me and literally dragged my body into an ambulance, threw me in there, and locked me up. I spent a week in a mental ward, 
Now, mind you, I was diagnosed because I had finally sought mental health treatment. I thought I was having a heart attack. I believed myself to be strong, but on hearing I was stop lost, I started having panic attacks, and I couldn't admit that I was mentally or emotionally broken. So I went into the hospital complaining of chest pain, and they had me seek a mental health professional. They diagnosed me with depression and anxiety disorder and adjustment disorder, but I was still set to be deployed, obviously a broken soldier, but still set to deploy. Goldsmith's, Goldsmith's ordeal did not end there. He ultimately obtained a general discharge from the military, but the paper cited the reasons for discharge as, quote, misconduct serious offense. The irony was not lost on the audience at the Winter Soldier event when Gold, Goldsmith continued. My serious events was trying to kill myself because I was so damaged by the war, the occupation in Iraq. It was misconduct for me not to get on the flight while I was chained or handcuffed to a bed on the hospital. So I lost my college benefits, the one thing that had really given me hope in life that I was looking for. You know, I was gonna be a student. I didn't know where, I don't know, I didn't know what I was going to study, but I knew I was going to college in that September of 2007. That didn't happen. My money is disappearing between VA visits and personal instability. I found it extremely hard to find a job. To tell you the truth, I haven't really looked because I'm having such a rough time. So I deliver pizzas on Wednesdays. That's what I am now, a pizza, de pizza delivery boy. I was a sergeant, I was a leader, I was a trainer, I was very well thought of, I was one of the most professional soldiers. I mean, I got the paperwork right here in front of me if anyone ever wants to see the proof that I was a very good soldier. But now I'm a pizza delivery boy who works once a week because that's the only job where I can call in a couple of hours before and say, I'm still at the VA, I'm waiting in line, I'm sorry I can't come in for a couple of hours. I interviewed Goldsmith shortly after his testimony. War is a really destructive thing, he told me. It follows you home and it doesn't go away. And that kind of, and what kind of homes filled with the specter of a distant war will this country be filled with as more of our broken, wounded, and destroyed soldiers are brought back? On that extremely grim note, um, the book is primarily actually about resistance that's happening in the U.S. military. And it's rather serendipitous timing that we get to be here tonight uh, in Seattle, in Washington State, not too far from Fort Lewis, where back in 2006, Lieutenant Aaron Watata, the highest ranking member of the military to openly refuse a combat deployment to Iraq said, I'm not going to deploy, I'm not going to be part of a, of a war of aggression that violates international law and the US Constitution. And he stood up and he was of course court-martialed, uh, assuming most of you know the specifics of the story. The military blew the trial, they couldn't retry him, and it was just uh, found out yesterday that Lieutenant Watata is finally going to be released next Friday from the U.S. military. And so at the end of the day, while it's been an extremely difficult trial uh, time period for Lieutenant Watata, uh, he will not spend one day in Iraq, nor one day in jail, for following his conscience uh, and, and uh, the U.S. Constitution and international law. And I'm happy to report that he has actually started a trend. There's more and more soldiers standing up, openly refusing combat deployments to both Iraq and Afghanistan now. I've been reporting on this very heavily. More are coming. And I want to uh, invite uh, anyone who would want to come for, to a Coffee Strong, a GI resistance cafe on the outskirts of Fort Lewis. There is a fundraiser in support of that uh, tomorrow night, also here in Seattle because these people need our help. These people in the military that are coming from stories like Eli Wright and Christopher Goldsmith, and if they can go through that and they can stand up and go up against the military without much support at all, imagine what kind of a GI resistance movement might happen in this country if we can find these people, throw our support behind them, let them know that we're with them, we've got their backs, if they're going to take these stands, we will support them financially, we will support them with lawyers, and we will support them with the media. And if we can do that, 
And I think we have absolutely no excuse not to do that. This is how a GI resistance movement is born. And a GI resistance movement is exactly what helped bring it into the Vietnam War. Because by the end of that war, by the end of that war, almost half the troops on the ground would not follow orders. It's kind of difficult for a government to prosecute a war when they have a military that basically half the people in the military are giving them the finger. And, and that's basically, in, in my judgment, when you look at the national security strategy today, the same, as, the same strategy under Barack Obama as it was under George Bush, and you look at the Quadrennial Defense Review Report, the same under Obama as it was under Bush, and you look at U.S. global hegemony as a mission in the, in the U.S. national security strategy, the only thing that's going to stop the march of empire in this country is a, a strong, vibrant GI resistance movement. And this country has a rich history of this type of movement, and we can do it again, but it's going to require all of us getting behind it, taking some risks, and making some real sacrifices. But it's absolutely possible. Thanks, everyone. You know, again, as you may have surmised from my, the, the few little hints I gave during my talk, I'm, I'm not a big supporter of Barack Obama. I, 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 well, of course, you know, his, his actions regarding, uh, you know, what, what was discussed regarding nuclear disarmament are certainly commendable, absolutely. Uh, regarding most of the rest of U.S. foreign policy, whether it's uh, policy regarding uh, U.S. stance towards Israel and halting illegal settlements or uh, not continuing to be uh, such staunch funders of, of the state as they continue to violate international law on a daily basis. Um, anything like uh, quote unquote peace talks or something like a one state solution, I, I just don't see it happening. I, I mean again we see kind of this harsh, sometimes harsh talk coming from Washington that, you know, Israel has to do this, they have to stop with the settlements, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the U.S. being really one of the only countries in the world with the real power to stop it by, like, cutting funding, for example, until international law was actually adhered to by the is Israeli state. Um, again, it's easy to kind of talk tough against, well, you have to stop the settlements, yada, yada, yada. But uh, when you actually have the power to stop it, but you're not stopping it. Stopping it, I think that says a lot more. Contracting soldiers, uh, mercenaries, information is a lot harder to come by because it's it's easier to get information on U.S. military personnel because you know government employees, public record by law, et cetera. Um, the only way, actually, for example, it's been possible to track the number of contractors killed is by uh, getting Department of Labor statistics, and even those have been really challenging. Um, we do know, for, for example, um, I don't have exact death totals. It's, it's far lower than in the military because overall, so far at least, uh, there's, there's fewer mercenaries deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan than there are U.S. military soldiers, but that's actually in the process of shifting um, again, thanks in large part to the Obama administration, we've seen a 25% increase in the use of mercenaries uh, to Iraq and a 29% increase to Afghanistan just since Obama took office. So um, I think roughly, if, if I remember right, at least regarding Iraq, the number of mercenaries who have been killed is roughly one quarter the number of U.S. military personnel that have been killed, at least in Iraq, but I haven't seen anything on Afghanistan. Uh, it, was, it was basically, uh, mustn't Obama know the fine line he's treading when, you know, we're looking at a situation where, you know, even using as many mercenaries are being used uh, to populate both these occupations. Um, you know, there's obviously a, a dire need for more troops and uh, uh, basically he alluded to uh, Obama's likely walking a very fine line and possibly even risking assassination. Um, and the reality is, I, I think, um, you know, where are they going to get these troops? That's the million dollar question now. They don't have enough now. Um, I'm actually working on a story now with uh, a colleague who we, we broke a story about a month ago about a, we called it Echo Platoon because it's the name of a platoon at Fort Bragg, which is comprised mostly of AWOL soldiers who have either been caught or turned themselves back in. And they throw them in this unit, it's about 50 to 60 people, along with a lot of other people who have mental health issues and the military won't treat them. And they let them basically sit there. They don't give them exit dates. They don't court-martial them and set a trial date. They let them sit there. 
uh, in, in basically a, a situation that's akin to jail. So there's, there was four to six of these guys per room, 50 guys sharing one latrine. They couldn't go more than 50 miles off post. Um, anytime their significant others tried to come visit them, they were harassed by their commanders. One woman was actually physically escorted, uh, put in the back of an MP vehicle, and taken off the base. Um, and so we started talking to these guys, and it turns out what the military would do is they would come by about once a month. A commander wouldn't say, all right, well, yeah, so you went AWOL, you have this on your record. Uh, if you go to Afghanistan, we'll forget all about this. Same with folks who were there who had already been diagnosed with PTSD. One guy was on suicide watch, Timothy Rich, and they tried to offer him to go to, Afga to Afghanistan. Uh, another guy was actually already on uh, a uh, meds diagnosed with PTSD and they tried to send him to Iraq and said you can get treatment while you're in Iraq. So, so this, and, then, and then they would basically walk by once a month and say you know you can go to Afghanistan we'll forget all about it and about half the people in there were doing it because it was either sit there and wait in this kind of you know zone of not knowing when you're gonna get out etc or finally well, at least if I go to Afghanistan that's a year theoretically then I would get out so that's where they're getting these people and that was at Fort Bragg in North Carolina where the 82nd Airborne is and then we backed up and we still kept asking around it turns out it's not just Echo Platoon at Fort Bragg it's actually at Fort Carson it's at, at actually at Fort Stewart it's at Fort Bragg now we're looking at some stuff at Fort Lewis ie it's all over the country so when they're looking at 45,000 more troops to Afghanistan and these are already the links they're trying to get people to send on Obama's first surge. Uh, again, you can kind of just imagine where this is going. And, and it's funny, we were just talking about a draft. I don't think there will be a draft because it'd be immediate political suicide. And it'd also be a government, a very stupid move of the government to basically automatically create a national resistance movement against both wars. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think it would happen, but certainly if there ever were a draft, we, we would see all kinds of hell being raised like we did during Vietnam. First of all, I, I will add that uh, a lot of the defense arguments for soldiers who are refusing deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of these lawyers are basically using the same stance taken by Aaron Watada regarding Iraq, and that is according to the UN Charter, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan violates international law because the UN Charter states there are only two reasons why a country is allowed to go to war, a just war. One, if uh, it has UN Security Council ratification, and two, in an act of self-defense. So people argue, well, Afghanistan's just because it's self-defense. Well, the, the, law the lawyers then argue, no, actually it's not, because uh, it wasn't the nation of Afghanistan, nor was it the people of Afghanistan that declared war on the United States. It was 19 guys that hijacked airliners, 15 of them from Saudi Arabia, none of them from Iraq, and none of them from Afghanistan. So therefore, these lawyers, people like Marjorie Cohn, president of the National Lawyers Guild, are arguing, I think rightly, that this is a violation, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan is a violation of both international law, because it violates the UN Charter, and also there's a thing in the US Constitution called the Supremacy Clause, Article 6, Paragraph 2, which states very clearly, all foreign treaties the US government signs, i.e. the UN Charter, become the supreme law of our land. So any soldier or commander or anyone else that agrees to follow an order to deploy to Afghanistan is violating both international law and the US Constitution and that includes everything uh, from Obama's first surge to the upcoming second surge. And regarding you know, what can this country do to defend itself against Al-Qaeda, uh, I would say, first of all, stop being engaged in a US policy basically bent on global domination. If you read the national security strategy of the United States, Which, which states very clearly that one of the key missions in the national security strategy is to open markets abroad and control natural resources of other countries and the shipping lanes of those, res those, those resources. So when you have a government that's basically actively invading and occupying other countries illegally, bombing people, starving people, supporting other countries that violate international law on a daily basis, then you're going to make a lot of enemies. So perhaps it'd be more effective to change a policy uh, something more aligned
align with physicians for social responsibilities like uh, protecting future generations, getting rid of nuclear weapons, providing humanitarian aid, things like this, instead of bombing people, that would probably be a bit more effective. I don't, I don't think I can answer that. I, I think, you know, I, I think one thing just out of my experience is that it's a, it's, it's a lot easier for me having been over in Iraq for nine months and seen war and seen what it does to civilians as well as then, uh, you know, interviewing the dozens of people I did for the book and seeing what it does to people in the military as well. It's very easy for me to remain pretty inspired on a regular basis to make sacrifices, do my work, fight against both these occupations and do what I can to, to try to end them. And it's harder for people who haven't really seen firsthand like the things that Eli Wright describes of, you know, these interrogations and, and abuses of authority and the killing of civilians. So I think it's, you know, it's easy in this country that we've never really seen direct war on the continent. And, and most people have never had direct experience with it. And, and then the folks who have, the veterans, are kind of left aside and oftentimes not given a voice. Um, and then, you know, thanks to the media, I think it's kind of a combination of, you know, having a, a totally bogus just about mainstream media. And then, you know, that's kind of, it's basically kind of helped most people in this country ignore things. Because in reality, like, just like what Amy Goodman says from Democracy Now!, you know, if people, and I, I agree with her when she says, if people in this country had one week of legitimate war coverage in the media, something akin to Vietnam, uh, we'd start to see some cages being rattled and some things shaken up in a very big way. If people really saw, um, you know, like for example, what a lot of the Arab media will show, um, and I, I think that that would change things a lot. Uh, he mentioned search and avoid missions. This is a, a moniker brought over from Vietnam. It's not a new thing in Iraq, but it basically, it was the first story I heard that, that really led to this book being written, which was uh, a guy I interviewed talked about uh, being very low morale. They didn't believe in the mission in Iraq. They, they were going out and parking their Humvees in fields and calling into their base every hour and, and saying, yeah, we're still searching the fields for weapons caches. We'll talk to you in an hour. And they would sit there and smoke cigarettes and drink soda and pretend. Um, and then I found that that was rampant. And I found that the more people I talked to, the more I heard it happening. And people like Seth Manzel down here at Coffee Strong finding ways to hack into computers and move their little blips around to kind of simulate that they were on missions when they were actually drinking tea with Iraqis. Um, these kinds of things were, were absolutely rampant and they're happening in Iraq to this day. I haven't actually heard it uh, happening in Afghanistan yet, um, but uh, I, I think you know this is certainly going to be the next area of focus because rest assured it is certainly happening there as well, especially amidst this uh, escalation. And keep in mind that it, you know as, as early as 2002, uh, less than a year into the occupation of Afghanistan, there were about 8,000 U.S. soldiers there. There's going to be 69,000 by the end of this year, and if uh, the military gets its way, we'll be looking at a number that puts it up over about 105,000 uh, well before the end of next year, and probably there'll be more on top of that. So certainly we'll be seeing uh, search and avoids, and I think it's just a matter of time before we'll start seeing some platoons refusing direct orders too, which we've uh, seen happen in Iraq quite a bit as well. So certainly there is resistance, and when you look at a massive, massive escalation with record numbers of Americans being killed in Afghanistan, and, and of course the major vast majority public sentiment in this country now, it's well over 56 percent at this point being against Afghanistan, that will only increase, and of course all this uh, shows us there's a very strong likelihood, pretty much a guarantee for more GI resistance in Afghanistan to come. Let's, let's thank Darwin one more time.